Welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. Blessing the Band Stage is a young pianist, composer, and band leader who's been really making waves here in the New York jazz scene for well over six years. James Francis tonight is performing music from his debut Blue Note Records release entitled Flight, which is produced by the great Derek Hodge. Now, this gentleman has played and continues to record with and perform with the likes of Pat Metheny, Chris Potter, Eric Harlan, just to name the endless few. But he was also featured on the Grammy Award winning hit by Chance the Rapper, No Problem, as well as he fills in and plays from time to time on The Tonight Show with the great Quest Love and The Roots. Tonight I had a chance to sit down to break bread with him to talk about some of his deep roots in Houston, some of his mentors ranging from the great Bobby Lyle to NEA Jazz Master Joanne Brackeen, as well as talk about some of his favorite pianists who have really contributed to his style as far as his formation, as well as how he interprets music and his sound. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the highlights of the official New York record release of James Francis tonight here at the Jazz Standard performing music from Flight here on The Pace Report here in New York City.
James Francis, congratulations. I have been following you for a while. I mean, flight tonight, the world is getting ready, and the world is getting ready to hear and see what this is all about. Yeah, you know, it's good to be here. You know, it was good to finally put all of it together, you know, in such a big scale and let people hear it. So it's a um, special night. This is on Blue Note Records and the masterful Derek Hodges, the producer. Yeah. How did you guys come about making this process work? It's funny. I met Derek when I was 14, like when he was playing with Robert Glasper a lot. Um, I used to go around and follow them. They would come to Houston and everything. And we always kept in contact. He was so um, such a great resource and a mentor all these years. So when it came time to make a record, you know, I tried to think of somebody who um, I would work just naturally with, and he was one of those one of those people. Now, listen to this album. It's very music for it. It's got a myriad of all the music that you like listening to. There's jazz, there's hip-hop, there's yeah. a little R&B. Let's talk about this journey, how we got here. I mean, this is all music to me. You know, I try not to think of genres and different categories and different boxes. I just try to... Um, it's trying to be authentic, you know. If you look in my playlist, what I'm listening to is just a a big arsenal of just all this music, like all the time. So I, I didn't want to, when I was making my first record, I didn't want to say, oh, I have to make a quote unquote jazz record. And, you know, I have to do this, place these standards, and I have to do this and let people know I can do this. It was just like, you know, let me just let people know where I'm coming from. So for me, that's where the real true artistry comes from when you're not trying to prove anything, you know. This record, I, you know, I feel like a lot of debut records, they're, it's kind of like a test or something, you know, you have to let people know, yeah, I'm gonna do this. But it's, for me, it was just about making music, making art, you know, much bigger than me. You know what's crazy? I, I'm a big Shaka Khan fan, and yeah, man, me too. That's, <laughs> that's my girl. And, and you hear you do, you do a revisioning and an up-to-date version of Ain't yeah. Nobody. How did that come about? Man, I've just always loved that song. That's me Me and my mom. is like one of our favorite songs to listen to. And ever since I was like six years old, I just always loved that song. So um, I was like, I want to I wanna arrange it, you know. And um, she actually heard it, surprisingly. And she really dug it. Chaka loved it. So um, getting the blessing from her on this arrangement was kind of, I was like, oh, man, that's kind of that's cool to feel, you know, somebody you've, been listening to your whole life gives you like a little nod it's, it's um kind of refreshing so with that arrangement i just kind of kind of envision like rufus and shaka doing it now if they were not jazz musicians i hate that term but just on some other shit you know they were just what would it sound like if they played this arrangement so that's what the recording was kind of like i tried to emulate <laughs> Oh, 
Tell the world about the musicians on this album. I mean, you have got some stellar, you got some dynamic musicians that are really doing their thing, not only in the jazz world, but also in the hip hop and the R&B world on this album. You know, most of these people are my best friends on this album. You know, I, it wasn't, the only person I think I first met was Kate, right before the record. Kate, KS, yeah, she's uh, the singing on Ain't Nobody Actually, but everybody else. They've been like my some of my best friends for like since before I even got to New York. So when it was time to make this record, I was like, "Look, let's just let's go in here and let's do what we always do." You know what I mean? And it's just like a family vibe, you know, brotherhood, and we just we knocked it out. You got Travis Burnus on Burnus, this. Burnus Travis, Burnus, you got uh, Jeremy Dutton, Houston, yes. Burnus, Houston, yes. Mike Moreno, he's from Houston. Uh, Joe Ross, been my best friend since we were like fifteen, from Chicago. Uh, Chris Potter, who's a uh, one of band leader who I work with a lot, um, great mentor. Um, yeah, Kate KS, amazing. Yeba, incredible. Chris Turner, sang on my first gig in New York actually when I was 18, and I've been following him since I was super young. So it was just like a big melting pot of just all my friends, you know. That's what I feel like it should be like music and like having a band band, you know, where it just nobody's scrambling to put something together. It was just. Let's go in here and document what we've, what we've been working on, you know? The last five years, man, you have been... Actually, since you landed on Planet Rock, I call New York City Planet oh, Rock. Yeah, absolutely. You have been very, very busy, and you, you have played with and are playing with a lot of different trio amalgamations, and also you're playing R&B and hip-hop. I, I just want to ask you, and now as this musician, what are some of these band leaders helping you as a band leader now, like Pat Metheny and Chris Potter? Yeah, I mean, all these guys, I, you know, it's funny, Eric Carl has this saying, like, you know, the greatest band leaders, they don't mold you to just be a sideman. They always, um, greatest band leaders want you to be, they train you to be your own band leader. And um, that's kind of what they've done. Like, playing with Pat is just... He's somebody who's been doing this for so long, and he knows how to play his music. He knows how in the ins and outs and every nook and cranny, he's worked everything out. Um, somebody like Chris Potter, same thing. They're just so meticulous with leading their bands. They're, they're super, they, let, they give you your freedom, but at the same time, um, it's always about delivering a message every time you play. Now, I understand that you and Eric Harlan are doing the duo record also. Absolutely, yeah. We've been playing duo, and um, we actually just did this thing. Um, I did this commission for the Jazz Gallery a couple months ago, and um, we did a trio with me, Eric, and Kate. Uh, we, we did that, which was really nice. Then um, we'll do duo gigs here, and then we'll go to France or, you know, tour Europe a little bit. And, yeah, Eric is somebody who's I call him my guru because I feel like everything he says, like all the advice he, he's given me, it's been like, wow, that's you know exactly what you're talking about and we even step into the music side I mean you just play one note with him you can just feel his personality and just just everything is there you know what I mean and I've looked up to him for so long so being able to work with somebody like him it's not not only just a musical like experience but just also like person to person he's a just gives gives a great energy you know 
You know, James, I, I, I've seen you play with quite a few people over the years. You're 23, but your experience and your 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 psyche is like you're 53. Oh, All of this music that you and 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 I say this because it's the maturity thing. I mean, yeah. you can go from Chance to playing with the Roots to playing with somebody like Pat Metheny, and those musical musicians I just named you, they're coming from different angles. Totally. I mean, it's, for me, I, I think of it all just as music. I, again, like I was saying, like, the notes are the notes. You know what I mean? It, for me, the thing that changes is just the feel a little bit. Feel and um, not even intention, just like the feel is usually what changes between those things. But other than that, it's all the same impact, I think, has the same feeling, same, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Same purpose, you know what I mean? Stravinsky. Igor Stravinsky. Classical music. How does his music and what he contributed to the world musically, how did he influence you musically? Harmonically, I mean, just you listen to any, any of his pieces, they're just so harmonically dense, but also there's like a really strong rhythmic aspect of it, to which I've just been influenced by. You know, when I was in high school, I was reading through his scores, I was playing some of his piano pieces. And he just, the thing I like about him, he doesn't write, like, traditionally, like, for piano. You know, he'll have you doing two things over here and two things over here. And he thinks of, like, the piano is literally like an orchestra, like, different things going on. And harmonically, he might stack one chord up against another chord and have different melodies going on. 
I don't know, he's just brilliant, and just the sounds that he gets out of, like, an orchestra or out of the piano is just, it's always just been intriguing to me, you know? I did a lot of digging up on you as far as some of your favorite piano players, and yeah, let's see. One, one guy in particular, in fact, this past summer, I, I, I did a big thing on Brian Jackson, and I told him, Art Tatum, I had to go back and listen to him. And every time I go back to him, I'm afraid of him because of the stuff that he's done that eons of pianists can't do, but they they do what he tries to do, but in a very different language. Yeah, I mean, Art Tatum, I mean, he's probably the most modern piano player that will ever walk this earth, honestly, because the things he was playing, even back in the 40s and early 50s, it was so far beyond even just pianistically where anybody is now, you know, just technically and just his ideas and how he would develop things. And he was like a, like an orchestra as well. Like when he sat down to play, it was just, it was so much more than the piano, you know. Do you think he thought, or do you think that was just, he knew what he had to do with those 88 keys? Man, I, he was just, I mean, I mean, it's all speculation, but he was just such a special guy. You listen to him play, it's just, He's, he's like you hear him play. It's like yeah, he's not from this world. It's it's coming from somewhere else. He's just a vessel. You know that's how I feel when I listen to him. Is like of course he practices a bunch, but at, at some point where it's like he's one of those people. You know he and I think Monk set the epitome of how pianists have to think outside the box. Absolutely. I mean Monk was another person who's a virtuoso in his own aspect. Just the way he wrote music and just the way he placed beats and rhythm and chorus he was just like another modern genius that people are still trying to figure out you know and yeah he's one of the most brilliant composers of all time another one is oscar peterson oscar peterson same thing for me i mean oscar who was who i used to try to like emulate the most coming up because he was he was like this tall, big guy, you know, I, I could relate to him. I was like, oh, man, he's like me. He's playing piano, you know, he makes the shit look cool. You know, always was dressed, you know, swagged out, very articulate when he spoke, you know. Could play. He woke him up at 7 a.m. to play. You hear him at 9 o'clock at night. He's just always sounded, like, amazing. And, yeah, he was somebody I wanted to be like for the longest time. The roaring, that 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 roar he does, I mean, it's insane. Yeah, man, it was just, he was, it was so cool to watch as like a 10-year-old kid. Or, like, oh man, like here's this guy, like, was just so elegant, you know, just so much, so regal, you know, when he sat down, it was just like he commanded the piano. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Oscar Peterson, he tried to be Nat King Cole. Exactly, and <laughs> exactly man. Nat King Cole is another one. I mean, people forget about Nat, but yeah, like those trio records where it's just him, bass, and guitar, man, it was that's some of the greatest piano playing. But, you know, he people just fall in love with his voice because his voice is just so smooth and just you hear it and you're like, yo, what is this? You know what I mean? But Nat's piano playing was equally as great. Now, I understand that you took the time to sit down with an NEA jazz master, Joanne Brackeen, who I, I, I interviewed here on the Pace Report. What were some of the things that she imparted on you as a pianist? And what, what are some of the things you now as a band leader are implementing as musical ideas and some of your musical concepts that we have here tonight? Absolutely. I mean, Joanne, you know, I used to have a, a combo class with her every week. And, um... She always knew I could play. That was never the thing. So she was always challenging me to, you know, like, oh, if you do that on this song, you know, I might try changing your thinking, you know what I mean? Because when you listen to Joanne play, she's just as free as ever, but it's, it's so controlled. When she plays, it's just, it's like watching a a kid with, like, a the universe in their hands, you know, just always trying to find something different, always trying to keep it interesting, you know? And she taught me just that, you know, never to get too comfortable on any part of the instrument, I always switch it up, I always, you know, find something that you're not used to. And um, I did this NEA thing, she asked me to play for the tribute thing, it was like they, um, who, who are the, the 
um, inductees this year was um, was, it was Joanne, Pat, and Diane Reeves, and Ted Barkin. Yeah, Todd Barkin. Todd Barkin. Yeah. We can edit that out, Todd. <laughs> and yeah, she she picked these three songs. She's like, I want you to, like, I'd love for you to play these. It was with, uh, I'll never forget, it was with Chris McBride and Terry Lynn Carey, and like, two of my favorites ever. So I was like, what, you want me to do this? Like, so, um, yeah, she chose these three songs, and they were just so, like, peculiar because it was something I really hadn't seen before, like, to be asked to play in, like, a trio setting. And it just kind of spoke to her, like, as a person. Like, you just read her songs, and it's just like, yeah, this is extremely Joanne, you know, and this is so, like, fresh. And just, yet yeah, it keeps you on your toes. I remember me, Christian, and uh, Terry Lynn, we were just, like, oh, scratching our heads, you like, okay, how do we... Who are we going to make this work? And we did, and I, th I think it's up on the NPR or something. But, um, yeah, Joanne is always, always keeps me on my toes. Uh. talk about Houston man because um you know I I did not realize that one of your mentors in Houston is the great Bobby Lyle and I have followed Bobby Bobby's played with everybody and he's I mean Bobby is such a soulful cat super soul he's he's another person I mean I guess when you talk about me being in these different areas of music and being comfortable a lot of it comes from Bob because when I, I, studied, I started studying with him when I was like 12, 
something like that. And um, yeah, you look at his career, he's done stuff with Bette Midler, you know, George Benson, you know, he was going to be in Jimi Hendrix, last man before he died, but Jimmy died, but, and he was also playing organ, he was playing piano, swinging, different trio settings, he was just, he's the GOAT, you know what I mean? And for him, he was, happened to be living in Houston at the time, he still does, and um, yeah, I owe a lot of credit to him, because he just took me and put me through his Bobby Lyle machine of piano, and between him and and uh, this other pianist, classical pianist, Rodolfo Morales, I, I just I thank both of them because they definitely um, took me from one place and just like helped me grow exponentially. But uh, Bobby, he yeah, he taught me my first jazz standards. He had me listening to records and we playing Bach, but then we'd be we go play Donna Lee or something. You know, he was just he was into it. He was into it. He was such a well-rounded musician, amazing person, great mentor, you know. Yeah. Another great Houston pianist. I'm wondering, did you ever encounter him, Joe Sample? Oh, man, yeah. Rest in peace. Joe I, I, Joe was the first jazz pianist I saw in person, actually. I was four years old, five years old, five years old. And um, he signed the poster. He said, always love your music. And I still have the poster to this day. And, um, yeah, he was a great friend of the family. I go see him a lot. Um, he always called me Little Oscar, actually, because referencing Oscar Peterson. But um, yeah, I was I grew up watching him live, like just being like inches away, just watching him play. Yeah. Um, the Houston High School of the Performing Arts. Yeah, yeah. Jason Moran, Robert Glasper, Chris Dave, Kendrick Scott, who's on the band stage with you tonight. Yeah. Beyonce, Mike Moreno, you, I mean, this school must really took a divested interest in making sure that you understand the rudiments of the history of this music. You know, the thing I credit HSPVA with is just giving young people a chance to work on themselves, you know. It was, again, like you say, like, understanding where the music was coming from, you know, learning standards, like learning all these tunes, like being proficient on your instrument, but also gave like a chance to people really young from age 14, the chance to just work on original stuff, you know, work on like writing songs, like work on playing in a small group. Um, like one of the big things there at the school was playing the combo, like they used to be the coveted thing, like they just like get in the combo and you would get like two hours every day, every other day to just play in a band. You had to be in a band and it was a class. And you would bring in tunes, you get to do gigs outside, you know, sometimes you'd travel a little bit, but it was just like you get a group of people that could all could play, you know, for high school. And you just work on music. And I think that's where a lot of us develops, you know, the chemistry and I mean, even a lot of us still play with the same people that we used to play with in common in high school, which is pretty cool to me. But it was just always just developing something. And I feel like a lot of people miss that kind of coming up in high school. They don't really get to that until, like, college, maybe. Or even after college, they try to start putting it bit together a band. But, yeah, we were just nurtured just way back then to just finding an original voice. It has to be something in the water because you... Jason Moran and and Robert Glasper, you guys are dynamic. You That's guys, thing. people don't admit. There's the, so many other piano players coming, right? right. <laughs> but so you, but but you guys have brought the next generation of Houston piano players to a whole nother light, and you guys are bringing a very different lane to how you guys are presenting the music. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, those guys there, they've really paved the way for people like me to even exist. You know, they've Man, they were on the forefront of really just modern piano playing in general. Like, you look at all the people on the scene now, they either are influenced by one of those two or took lessons by one of those two. And and just to see them and to know them is just such an honor, you know what I mean? Just because they're really highly respected and you can just hear it in the music now. Like, in the 21st century, you can just hear all of their influence, like, everywhere, just between those two guys. <laughs>
Grammy Award winning song by Chance the Rapper, No Problem. Yeah. And again, this is another part of your diversity and how you've responded well to the music that is really, really popular right now. How did that collaboration come about? And where are you musically as far as hip hop? Who's some of the catch are you digging right now? Yeah, it's funny. So the Chance thing is, is a great story. I was um, at home and I got a text message. Um, a friend of mine is named Ivan Jackson. I knew him from a Stanford Jazz workshop years ago. And he was like, hey, um, can you play on this Chance, the rapper song? Like something went wrong. We need to kind of put it together super last minute, kind of remake it. I'm going to send you uh, the demo. Don't show it to anybody and um, just come to the studio tomorrow. So I listen to it, and for me, like I, I get hit up for shit all the time. So like, yo, you know, this song is so and so. I'm like, okay, whatever. I, I don't care. Like, let's let's make music. And you know, I treat everything. I try to treat everything the same, whether it's for some big star, pop star, or something, or if it's just you know, we plan some tiny club in the village. You know, I don't I don't care. Like if I if I agree to do something, like I'm gonna treat it the exact same way because that's you gonna play it like it's your last gig. Yeah, I, you know, I hopefully, you know, but usually I, I I just love to play music, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, that was a total sidebar. So, anyway, I show up to the studio, and he's like, can you just play over the song? And, um, yeah, it's for Chance the Rapper, it's for, his, um, for Coloring Book. I was like, cool. And uh, I remember I showed it to Jeremy. I played it for Jeremy. We were living together at the time. I was like, yo, like, check this out. He's like, yo, man, that's, that's probably going to be a hit. Like, that sounds crazy. He's like, I was like, really? Like, like, I, you know, I was just, like, going to do a job. And I played a couple notes. I remember I did it. I was like, I'm going to try to go in there for an hour and see if I can keep it within an hour, like, to, just to set, like, a little goal for myself. And I did. I played a couple notes, and um, they had chopped it up, did this and that. And before I know it, it was out, like, a month later or something. It was a hit. It was, it was a, a hit. huge hit. I was like, man, I barely played anything on it. It was like a couple notes here and there, but just to be a part of something like that, I was like, man, this is pretty cool, and I appreciated the call, and yeah, it was like a, a huge hit. Like pretty, It was like a historic thing, for that whole album. Quest Love is also a mentor to you also, and I see you on, I see you from time to time in, on, on the Tonight Show getting yeah. down. You know, Questlove, again, he's another brother who really understands his purpose as far as a musician and bringing it forward. And oh, man, I, man, Questlove, he's been such an inspiration and a mentor for me. Like, I, start, I first started working with them um, like when I was 19, something like that. And, um, yeah, I remember the first guy, I was so nervous. I was like, oh, my God, I hope they don't hate me. You know, because there's such a – I looked up to all of those guys for so long. You know, I mean – before any of the TV stuff, you know, just enjoying those records. And even when they first started at uh, Jimmy Fallon, like, the late night show, before it was the night show, I used to stay up, like, every night and watch them, watch him, James Poyser, who's another guy who's become a great mentor, and, like, one of my heroes. And just to be in that circle and just to be treated like family is just it was a blessing, you know, because I have so much respect for all those guys. And Questlove, he's a freaking genius, you know, you could talk to him about any record, any song, he can listen to something, be like, oh yeah, that's this, this, and this from 1975, re-released, Japanese release, like, he's crazy. So, um, he's somebody I hope to be like one day, you know, in just terms of his knowledge and just information that he has. James Francis, what does jazz music mean to you? Oh man, it's just playing what you feel in the moment, like playing music, you know, you're responding, it's a response. So whatever you're feeling, whatever's going on in your life, whatever is going on in the world, it's just your reaction. That's what it should be, at least to me. Yeah. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the incomparable James Francis for his time. Make sure you go out and buy his Blue Note Records debut, Flight, which is now available on Amazon.com as well as iTunes. For more information on James's upcoming club and tour dates, please visit him on his Facebook page at facebook.com jamesfrancis88, as well as his website jamesfrancismusic.com. I'd like to personally thank Ms. Karen Kennedy for arranging my time with James, as well as the wonderful staff and management here at the Jazz Standard for their warm hospitality. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, 
for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Oh,